Can you give it up for being here? Welcome to the Gathering Church. Excited to be here this evening. Excited for the opportunity to uh, get back into the Word of God. I've spent the majority of the day um, studying and just diving into Scripture. I'm excited about uh, where God is taking us through His Word. Uh, for those, again, that, that may be watching online, uh, we want to welcome you. Uh, as well, my prayer is that God has richly blessed your homes and that uh, the worship experience uh, was felt even in your living rooms or in your cars or wherever you may uh, be watching. Uh, excited to, to dive into the word. We are um, in a series titled The Names of God, the, the Names of God, and we kicked off week one last week diving into uh, the name Yahweh. For some, I believe last week we, we unearthed or we, we revealed, and for others, I believe that we reminded them of the truth that Yahweh is the covenant name of the God of Israel, that it comes from the Hebrew word of I am. The name Yahweh refers to God's self-existence, that, that God is life, and he has life in and, and of himself. He is Yahweh. He is the great I am. It's, it's why after God finished forming Adam from the dust of the ground and he had perfectly and, and, and precisely put together the most complex parts of, of mankind and he put the, the joints and the marrow and he put the muscles and he wrapped it in, in flesh and the organs were placed exactly where they needed to be. That even after all of that, that God still had to breathe the breath of life into Adam for him to become a living soul. It's because with all of the pieces in place, you can have all of the pieces to the puzzles in place. You can have everything that you thought you would ever need, but if the presence of God and if the spirit of God isn't there, it's lifeless. God says, I am the great I am. I am the, the giver and the taker of life itself. Life exists in and of me all by myself. The name Yahweh speaks to God's utter independence, that God is the absolute definition of, of truth, that he is, he is constant, that God is the absolute reality. The name Yahweh speaks to the fact that God needs nothing, but he is everything. It speaks to the fact that he's sovereign or that he has ultimate, ultimate power, that he has no beginning and his existence will, will never end. The name Yahweh speaks to the fact that God is immutable. It speaks to the fact that God will never change. The name Yahweh speaks to the fact that God is, is omnipotent, that he's omniscient, that he's that he's omnipresent. That's why God told Moses in, in Exodus 6 that I am Yahweh the Lord. I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty, but I did not reveal my name Yahweh to them. As much as God walked and, and talked with Abraham, with all of the promises and with all of the covenants, that he established with Abraham and, and through Abraham. As much as we revere Abraham as the father of all nations and the father of our faith, God says that there's a piece of me that I didn't even reveal to Abraham. God says that there are some, some characteristics, there are some attributes, there are, there are some things about me, there are some intimate things about me that I didn't even reveal to Abraham. That Abraham didn't even have the opportunity to see what I'm about to reveal to you, Moses. And he says to Moses, so when you stand before Pharaoh and when you stand before the children of, of Israel, tell them that I am sent you. Tell them that, that the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham and, and the God of Isaac and the God of, Abri, Abri, of Israel is, has sent you. Moses told God in, in essence that this mission, this mission that you're sending me on, God, this assignment that you've tasked me with, this, this thing that you've commissioned me to do is, it's a death wish. And on top of that, I don't even know who to say sent me. God says, tell them Yahweh, the great I am, 
sent you, and the rest is history. And we find ourselves in week two of this series, The Names of God. And you may be asking yourselves, why are we, why are we spending any time talking about the names of God? What's so important about the various names of God that we need to allocate any real time? What's, what's so important about the names of God that we need to set aside any real attention or re any real effort learning and, and studying and, and understanding the names of God? It's, it's, it's clear that he's God. It's clear that, that he is Lord. It, it isn't vast enough that, uh, to encompass the totality of who he is by just calling him God or Lord. And my response to that would be that God doesn't need a name at all to speak to the absolute power. God doesn't need a name at all to speak to the, the absolute dominion and the, the absolute authority that he possesses. One million names of God spoken in unison by every man under the sun and under the sound of my voice isn't broad enough to, to accentuate or emphasize the entirety of who God is. What we must understand and what we must, must come to realize is that his names aren't meant to remind him of who he is. God knows exactly who he is and he needs no reminder. God doesn't need a name to remind him of his power or his position. He doesn't need a name to remind him that he's the, the creator and the sustainer of life. He doesn't need a reminder to, to, to show that he is sovereign, that he is all deity, that he has all power in the palm of his hands. His names are meant to remind us of who he is. Read through the Old Testament and you'll see time after time after time that after God demonstrates who he is through, through action that the children of Israel will name the location of that spot after God's character. Read through the Old Testament when Abraham, uh, his faith was tested and God had instructed him to sacrifice his, his only son, Isaac. The Bible declares that Abraham lifted his hand to, to kill his son and that as he did, uh, lifted his hand to do so that an angel of the Lord cried out, Abraham, Abraham, don't lay a hand on your son for you have revealed, you have shown that you truly do fear God. The Bible declares that at suddenly and at, at once that a ram appeared in, in a bush and that Abraham was able to sacrifice the ram in, in place of his son. The Bible declares that Abraham named that place Yahweh Jireh. The Lord will provide. Yahweh Jireh or, or, or Jehovah Jireh is a name that I've heard since I was my children's age. But so often I hear this particular name of God in, in reference to people who simply want to access the provision of God. They, 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 they reference Yahweh Jireh because they want to have a ram in the bush experience. I want to have a similar experience as, as Abraham, Jehovah Jireh, Je Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Jireh. I've heard the name since I was, was old enough to walk. The problem is that these individuals, they want to experience the provision of God without the willingness to sacrifice the promise of God. Abraham only knows Yahweh Jireh because he was willing to part ways with the very thing that he waited his entire life for God to give him. He never would have had a ram in the bush moment if he wasn't willing to sacrifice the, the very thing that he wanted most. And we go around here calling Yahweh Jireh, Jehovah Jireh, not understanding that there was a sacrifice needed for him, for him to ever have a ram in the bush experience. There would have been no ram if there was no obedience. There would have been no provision if there was first no, no submission. And we go around singing just Jaira, 
not understanding that there was some sacrifice involved. That Abram had waited 25 years for this sacrifice. That God had promised him some things and he had no heir. And the moment that God gave him a son, God says, I want you to take this son up, up the mountain and I want you to sacrifice him. And right before he was about to deliver the blow, the, the angel of the Lord said, Abraham, Abraham, stop. And my question is, what are we willing to part ways with? To have a Yahweh Jireh experience. What are you willing to let go of? What are you willing to relinquish? What are you, what are you willing to say, God, this is, this is yours? God, I just got finished singing, all I need is you, so I shouldn't have a promise relinquishing anything. The title, the, the position, the, the status, the car, God, whatever it is, it's yours. And we've conditioned ourselves to, to sing these songs without any real understanding of the sacrifice associated with the ram. Read through the Old Testament and you'll see time and time again that the children of Israel name their, their locations or their destinations after God's character. When the angel of the Lord appeared to, to Gideon in the book of Judges and he told Gideon that with the strength that you have, go and rescue the children of Israel from the Midianites. Gideon was initially frightful because he had seen the angel of the Lord face to face and he said, oh, sovereign Lord, I am doomed. Because he didn't think that he could see an angel face to face and live. But the angel replied to Gideon and said, do not be afraid, you will not die. And the Bible declares that Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and he named it Yahweh Shalom. Which means the Lord is peace. Yahweh Shalom was a name birthed through a divine encounter with an angel of the Lord after the divine appointment of an ordinary man. It was through Gideon's position that he was able to experience God's peace. We'll go around creating hell on earth and calling out for Yahweh Shalom. The list goes on and on and on, but I want us as a church to be mindful of the fact that these names aren't intended to remind God of his power. These names aren't intended to remind God of his, of his authority or his sovereignty. They're intended to remind us. We're nearly halfway through, through the year, believe it or not. We're almost in June, and I started to reflect on a couple things this morning when it dawned on me, like, man, we are halfway through 2022. Already. It'll be Thanksgiving and Christmas before you know it. And so I started reflecting on a couple things. And the first thing that I started to reflect on was, was the state of the world. And in the last two and a half years, we've, we've seen and we've witnessed some, some unprecedented things. There's been an unprecedented number of events that we've seen play out that have shaken every aspect of, of the global construct. We've seen racism exposed and, and on display and encouraged like never before. We've seen wealth inequality and food insecurity has, has only worsened as, as families all over the world struggle to, to eat a decent meal and while working families struggle to, to pay for the most basic necessities in life. Wars and, and rumors of wars have only increased between neighboring countries who, who have conflict. The rise in interest rates has only magnified the, the disparity in home ownership. Crime has increased in urban and suburban communities. Megachurches and pastors have been exposed and dismantled due to allegations and cultures of greed and abuse. Gas prices are at an all-time high. Schools are underfunded and devalued. Synthetic drugs and opioids are killing teenagers, teenagers at an alarming rate, and it seems that the world is interested in seeking out hope in every other capacity and corner of the world except for Jesus Christ. 
The second thing that I started to reflect on this morning was realizing that we're nearly halfway through the year and with everything that has happened in the world that I just mentioned that which is only a fraction of our reality. I spent some time reflecting on what the Holy Spirit has been saying to this house and to this ministry this year. Because I believe that our spiritual diet and what we're being fed by the Spirit of God and through the power of God's Word aligns with the times that we're living in. We kicked off this year with an eight-week series called Battle Tested. Digging into some of the, the war fronts that we're faced with on a daily basis. We talked about the, the battle for this region that God has called this ministry to. And I shared some of the statistics about uh, the atheist population in Washington State and the percentage of people that attend a, a worship service on a weekly basis. And I shared with you how... Our purpose is to reclaim this region uh, street by street and block by block and city by city. We talked about the battlefield of the mind and the power of understanding our thoughts and, and our motives and relinquishing our thoughts and our motives to the, the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. We talked about the power of the tongue, the battle of the tongue, and how our words are seeds that produce fruit. fruit. And how the Bible literally says that by our words are, are we condemned and by our words are we justified. That life and death are in the power of the tongue and, and those that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. We talked about the battle for family and how Joshua declared while he, was, while he was on his way out, he called all of Israel together. Every tribe and every family. After he had given them possession of the land that Moses had promised to him, Joshua called the children of Israel together and he said, Choose ye this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, as for me and mine, we will serve the Lord. From battle tested, we spent three weeks talking about the shift and how each seasonal change in life requires a, a personal shift, and that, that shift requires something different, and it varies with the seasons. And it was in this series that we realized that if we're unwilling to shift our approach with each new season, then we're susceptible to struggle because of our own stagnation. After the shift, we transitioned to a four-week series on the house of prayer based on the scripture where Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. We talked about four key points, a life of, of prayer as a foundation. And where there is no foundation for prayer, then you're bound to sink. We talked about prayer as a structure or a frame that gives our life shape, and it literally is what we hang our life on. We talked about prayer as a door that, that gives us access. There's ingress and, and egress with the power of prayer and that our bodies are a temple. And Adrian wrapped it up where we talked about our prayer as a roof or a covering that's not only intended to insulate, but it's also intended to protect and now we find ourselves in a series diving into the names of God. And what the Holy Spirit began to reveal to me this morning is that what we've been fed this year so far isn't simply indicative of where we are as a ministry. But it's also reflective of where the world and more importantly, the body of Christ is headed. In essence, the Spirit of God was saying that nothing that I've spoken through this platform is, is by happenstance or, co or coincidence. Holy Spirit was saying that I need you to pay attention to what I'm telling you. And so if the direction is to spend some intimate time learning and understanding and researching and, and teaching on the names of God, then it's because the time will come when we'll need to know that God is more than just the creator and the sustainer of life. Holy Spirit is saying that if we're being intentional about digging into the characteristics and, and the attributes of who God is, it's because without a shadow of a doubt, I need you to know that God is bigger than just being a creator and sustainer. That he's also Yahweh Rapha, the God that heals. It's not enough just to know him as creator. 
I need to know that there isn't an epidemic that's too wide. I need to know that there isn't a pandemic too large that our God is incapable of healing. I need to know without a shadow of a doubt that my God has both the power and the, and the propensity and he has the capacity to heal contaminated water. That my God has the power and the propensity to heal food shortages. He has the power to heal the brokenhearted. He has the power to heal the lame and the sick and the deaf and the blind. And he has the power to heal all manners of disease and affliction. I need to know that he's more than creator and sustainer. He's, he's Yahweh Rapha. The Holy Spirit is saying we don't have the luxury of waiting until calamity strikes and until injustice prevails to recognize Jesus is more than just our Savior. But he's also Yahweh Sitkanu. The Lord is our righteousness. Shame on us if we wait until the midnight hour when all hope is lost, when everybody has turned their back on us and we have nobody else to count on before we realize that God is always also Yahweh Shammah. The Lord is there. For too long, the body of Christ has been complacent with, with simply viewing God the Father as just the creator of heaven and earth. For too long, the, the body of Christ and the church has been content with Jesus simply being our access and our token into heaven. Too long we've been content ignoring and neglecting the presence and, and the power and the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God is saying, I need you to spend some intimate time. I need you to be intentional. I need you to on purpose spend some time learning my name. Not for the purpose of sounding super spiritual and, and righteous because that's just religion and it'll get you nothing. God says, I need you to study my names because my names reveal my character. And when affliction strikes, I need to know that I can call on a God that's bigger than my pain. When the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, I need to know that my God is a protector. When division and chaos and calamity strikes and all hell is broken loose, I need to know that my God is bigger and greater than it all. I need to know that he's Yahweh. That he didn't just create the world, but he holds it in the palm of his hands. I need to know that he's the great I am. And whatever I need him to be, he is in that moment because he loves me. God says, I need you to know my names. Not so you can walk around sounding spiritual. Not so you can walk around praying sounding like you know something. But I need the intimacy. And God says, if you want to know Yahweh Sitkanu, I can, I can show you Sitkanu. If you want to know Shalom, I can show you Shalom. But know that in order to know peace, you've got to go through some hell. In the book of Genesis, the 17th chapter, the Bible says when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, the, great, the God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abram fell face down on the ground. Then God said to him, this is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations and kings will, will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give the entire land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner to you and your descendants. It will be their possession forever and I will be their God. God appears to to Abram here in the book of Genesis, the 17th chapter, and he proclaims that he is El Shaddai, God Almighty, the sufficient one. And as much as I want to just dive into the text, it's, in, it's imperative that we set the stage for what's happening in this exchange between El Shaddai and Abram. 
As much as I just want to focus on the name of God, I want us to analyze Abram's response during this exchange. Because it's a response that I don't think many of us would have in this juncture of life or if we were in Abram's shoes. Has this been the first time that God appeared to Abram and made the, de the declaration that this promise that he would turn him into a great nation, that through him the world would be blessed? And I wouldn't have any questions if this was the first time they talked. If this had even been the second time that God appeared to Abram and declared that his descendants would, would outnumber the stars in the sky and the, the sand on the seashore, then I wouldn't have any issues with this conversation. But the Bible says just three chapters back in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, that the Lord said to Abram, leave your native country, your, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that, that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with content. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. The Bible says in verse 5 that Abram was, was 75 years old when he left Haran. And then you can skip down to Genesis, the 15th chapter, the first through the fourth verse, and it reads, Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and, and said to him, Don't be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are you and your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eliza of, of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all of my wealth. You've given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Then the Lord said to him, no, your servant will, will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will, who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abram outside and, and said to him, look up into the sky and, and to count the, scar, the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. I don't, I don't proclaim at all to be the best at math. I get a bit hung up on fractions and, and I hate variables. But if Abram is, is 75 when God tells him to leave his native land in Genesis 12, and Abram is 99 in Genesis 17, 1, then, then basic math lets me know that it's been 24 years since God told Abraham about his promise. And God presents himself before, before Abraham. He appears before Abraham in Genesis 17, 1, and declares that he's El Shaddai, the, the all-sufficient one. And I had a hard time connecting the dots here, and, and you're the all-sufficient one, and you've made this promise 24 years ago, and, and here I am at, at the age of 99, and I see no promise. I have no heir. I don't even know what's going to happen with my wealth when I die. The Bible says that he promised Abram verbatim over those 24 years. Over that 24-year span, you'll see 10 specific things that God promised Abram. He told him, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those that bless you and curse those that treat you with contempt. All the flammies of the earth will be blessed through you. I will give this land to your descendants. I am giving you this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. I will give you so many descendants like the dust of the earth, they, they cannot be counted. I will protect you and reward, your reward will be great. You will have a son of your own and, and he will be your heir. And then God told him to look up into the sky and to, to count the stars and if you can, however many stars you can count, your descendants will, will be far greater than that. And the question that I have to ask myself, 
And the question that we have to ask ourselves is that after 24 years of hearing the Lord declare his promises, you will be great. You will be a great nation. Your, your descendants will, will uh, outrun the, the, the number of sand on the seashore and you'll have more descendants than the stars in the sky. And I will make your nation great and I will protect you and I will, well, I will bless you after hearing the Lord declare promise after promise after promise for, for 24 years but not seeing any real manifestation of the promise, how would you respond? Let's, let's, let's switch shoes with Abram just for a second. And for 24 years, God has appeared to me from time to time, getting me all hyped up. And God, when you say it, I'm ready to go. It's not... It's not I'm telling you, and you got to wait a little bit, but you said it, and, and, and now I'm ready to be a great nation. So what, what are we doing? But over the span of 24 years, God has made promise after promise, and there's been covenants, and there's been circumcisions, and there's been relationships, and there's been promises again, and promises again. And 24 years later, he still has nothing to show for it. How do you respond? How do you respond when you know what God has promised you, but your outlook still looks grim? How do you respond when God has promised you healing, but, but the report still shows a, a positive diagnosis? How do you respond when God has promised that your womb would be blessed, but, but infertility is still a struggle for you? How do you respond when God told you to launch it? To walk it, to, to, to move, to, to go, to do, to be. And he said to go and you went and you did and you became and things still aren't lining up the way that you thought they would. You see what I realized after reading through the life of Abram and just reading through the Bible in general is that there should never be a question of who God is. God was El Shaddai before the promise. God was El Shaddai after the promise was declared. God will be El Shaddai once the promise is fulfilled. Because he maintains absolute control over all through the ages. That's why the Bible, why the Bible says in Hebrews in 13 that he is the same today, yesterday, and, and forevermore. His position as Yahweh doesn't, or, or El Shaddai doesn't change. I'm God Almighty before I ever told you about the promise. I'm God Almighty before you were even conceived. I, I was God Almighty when I shared a, 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 a tad bit of the, of the promise with you. The question will always come back. The question is never about who God is. The question is always how do we respond? in between the promise and the provision? How do we respond in between the promise and the provision? Well, God, you told us to move to the city and to go and to go here and to start this and to do that, and we've done everything that you've asked us to do. And we're still not seeing any fruit. How about this one? God, God, you told us last year to, to launch this ministry, and you told us that you'd catapult this ministry and that you'd use it to set a region of, of people on fire. And every week it seems like less and, and less people are showing up, God. And I, I know that you operate outside of the confines of time, but God, I got an expiration date. God, I've got a time limit on myself. There's limits to what I can do and, and when I can do it. And God, I, I know what you promised me last year. And I, I know what I see, God, and, and things aren't lining up. I've been obedient. God, I did exactly what you said when it didn't feel good. 
God, when I had second thoughts about it, I, I still went through with it, God. When I didn't fully understand the picture, God, I, I went forth with it, God, and it, it doesn't seem like things are adding up what's happening. God, where are you? What are you waiting for? I, I, I can't be the only one asking the question. God, what are you waiting for? What, what, what's the problem? I've, I've been obedient. It's, it's not that I've been fighting you on this thing. Against my own desires, God, I stepped out. Against my own desires, God, I, I went forth. Against my own desires, God, I, I put myself out there. And things still aren't lining up the way that you said that they would. What, what are you waiting for? I can't be the only one. And I'm reading through scripture. El Shaddai, God Almighty, the sufficient one. And I put myself in the position of Abram who was told 24 years ago that you would be a, become a great nation and through you the nations of the world would, would be blessed. And 24 years later he has no fruit, he has no seed, he has no possession. And God appears before him again in, in Genesis, the 17th chapter, and it's imperative that we look at Abram's response. The Bible says that when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life and I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abram fell face down to the ground. And I stopped my sermon here. There are no three key takeaways this evening. There are no three points that you can have that will radically change the course and the direction of your life forever. The takeaway is found in Abram's response. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Now, either you believe that or you don't. God, it, it's been 24 years, but you're either God Almighty, the, the sufficient one, or you're not. You either have all control or you don't. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abram fell face down on the ground. And the question that I have for you, and then I'm going to take my seat, is when is the last time you found yourself face down before God? Because many of us have this position. This is the position of many of us. And I stopped my, my studying, I stopped writing notes, I stopped reading. Because the Holy Spirit just placed on my heart, give the people an opportunity to worship me now. He's El Shaddai. God Almighty. Self-sufficient, the, the all-sufficient one. And I know that there are some things that he's promised you that, that haven't come to pass yet. God, I, I don't see the manifestation of it yet. God, there are some things that you said would work out vastly different than the way that I see them now. And the question that I have for you tonight is, when is the last time you've had your face to the ground before God?
God could appear before Abram in chapter 17 with a different position, with a different heart posture. God, why are you, why are you, why are you here again telling me about the promise? Why are you here again reminding me about what you, I know what you said in chapter 12. I know what you said in chapter 15. I I know about the covenant, God. We've already gone over the covenant. I'm good on the covenant. God, I need you to come through. Responsibility in our own time to, to study the word of God, not just to read it, but to dive into it. I don't know where we go next week, but I know we're not shaking in the names of God. And so and I appreciate your patience. I know it's, it's getting a bit late, but I dare not apologize. I'm excited about what God is doing. try to be intentional about pushing uh, family night throughout the week. Wednesday nights, uh, made men, we're back, back to uh, Bible study online, 7 p.m. on Zoom, uh, every season, Thursdays at 7 p.m. Uh, on Zoom. And I think that's it for the announcements. Uh, offering, uh, I will keep it sweet, and I believe that people so what to give and when to give and how to give, not throwing percentages or numbers or anything else out there, but prayers that as God places it on your heart to give, that you are obedient to whatever that is, uh, so that we can continue to move the ministry forward. I, I wholeheartedly still believe the promise. Uh, and that, that isn't going to change. And so, uh, however you
whatever you see fit. Um, there's ways to give online. There's information outside on, on how to give. But um, equally as important as giving is sharing. And uh, sharing what's happening here, inviting somebody out, encouraging somebody else to, to show up, sharing on uh, social media what's happening here. Um, we want people to know God in their own way. somebody else to come out uh, to see what God is doing. Uh, but that's it. I pray that you were blessed by, uh, by the message. Week one, Yahweh. Week two, El Shaddai. And we'll see what God has in store for us next week. Uh, I dare not close without at least offering the prayer of salvation. And so if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, cannot close service without at least extending the opportunity to accept the gift of salvation. So asking that you would close your eyes and whether this is your first time praying and confessing or you've prayed it before, I pray that you would pray it and encourage that person that's praying it for the very first time. Repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I confess my sins and ask for your forgiveness. Please come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died and were raised for the dead. For the remission of my sin. Take complete control of my life. And help me to walk in your ways. Jesus, I believe that you died for me. And now I'm going to live for you. In Jesus' name. God, we thank you for your loving kindness and for your tender mercies. We thank you for the simplicity yet the complexity of your word. We thank you for the seeds that were sown, the hearts that have been changed, the weights that have been lifted, the minds that have been renewed, the marriages that have been uh, made stronger, the fires that have been lit, the lives that have forever been changed, the trajectory that's can forever change the course and direction of our life. I thank you for what's happened tonight. I pray that this is a night that we can mark on, my cal on our calendars. And we'll be able to look back weeks and months from now and say that this was the night that things changed. This is the night I surrendered. This was the night that I gave in. This is, this is the night that I let go. This is the night that I said I'm ready. God, we believe that you are the sufficient one. You are El Shaddai. You are God Almighty. I believe that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. God, I pray for traveling grace. I pray for your protection throughout the remainder of the week. I pray that your windows would be open, God, and that you shower down blessings of peace and favor and joy and healing and goodness. That every need would be met, that you give us opportunity to be a blessing to somebody that stands in need. to him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And the church said, amen. You are dismissed. Give somebody a high five or a hug on the way out. God bless you. God